Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good day. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's free webinar, Accounting for Startups, What Founders Need to Focus On, with Ryan Johnson from Early Growth Financial Services. And my name is Erica Malzberg, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, this presentation is going to run about 40 minutes. It, it may be a little bit less. We'll see how it goes. Um, we're totally open to questions. So if you have any questions as we go along, please just jump right in and enter them into the question field. You can also tweet them to us at EarlyGrowthFS with the hashtag Startup Accounting. Don't just raise your hand. Just go ahead and jump right in with those questions. And um, we'll take them as they come, or um, we can answer them in the Q&A at the end. We'll leave some time there. Before we jump in, I just want to start by introducing Ryan Johnson. Um, I believe this is Ryan's first webinar with us, so we're very excited to have him here. Ryan is the VP of Operations for Early Growth Financial Services, overseeing and supporting all senior accountant support staff. Ryan also personally administers accounting support systems for client companies across a variety of industries, ranging from high-tech startups to e-commerce to boutique investment banks. Ryan has a passion for supporting and growing startups into stable, thriving businesses. So, hi, Ryan. How's it going? Very good. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thanks for everyone for attending. Of course. Um, okay, great. So before we jump into the content, you want to just start by saying just a few words about Early Growth Financial Services? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, Early Growth is really an outsourced finance and accounting solution. Um, the way I like to describe it to people who haven't worked with us um, or don't have a relationship with Early Growth is that we're really, you know, we're really capable of providing anything you'd expect from an internal Fortune 500 accounting and finance department. Um, you know, really anything from taxes to valuations to day-to-day -day accounting, bookkeeping to CFO level kind of strategic guidance. Um, and we do all of that, um, but on an as-needed and an hourly basis. So really looking to kind of execute on these needs um, on the accounting and finance side of your business um, at the level of engagement that fits your business. Um, so that's a little bit about early growth. We're headquartered in San Francisco, but we've kind of got, um, I like to say, boots on the ground all across the country, um, both on the East Coast and the West Coast and kind of everywhere in between. Um, so, you know, great, great organization. Love being a part of it. Love working with startups. Um, it truly is my passion. Much for uh, for listening in. Great, thanks, Ryan. So, um, why don't you just first give everyone a, a little overview of, of what we're going to be covering in today's presentation? Absolutely. So, really, we're talking about kind of accounting essentials for startups, and we'll talk a little bit about what accounting considerations that we need to be making um, at different stages of your business and in regards to different kind of pieces of your of of uh, your business operations. Um, so, we'll talk a little bit about what accounting considerations to make prior to receiving funding and also post-funding, um, the type of systems that you might want to look at initially, you know, what to think about with taxes, AP and AR, things like financial projections and reporting and valuation. So really some of the, the kind of initial needs um, or things that we need to be thinking about when we start a new business and we're looking to grow that business to make sure that we've got a scalable kind of accounting infrastructure behind the scenes um, that will help to support growth. Right, yeah, just sort of the, the building blocks, right, to get us started. So let's start out with that accounting pre-funding. So before your company's actually gotten any any money, any investment dollars, um, what are the important things that you should be thinking about? Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on each one of these bullet points and just give you a little bit of background of why we think these are really kind of the most important um, or some of the most important considerations initially when you're uh, building the accounting and finance infrastructure for your your new startup. Um, and so one of the most important things that we like to do, and also one of the easiest things that we can do, is open a specific business banking account. Um, so get, get out of the habit of commingling funds with your personal bank accounts. Um, there's numerous reasons why this can be kind of tragic for a young company. Um, but one of the quickest and easiest examples is just that it's really easy to lose track of your business expenses. Um, and that can cause problems in a number of ways. Uh, not only the fact that uh, you know, you lose track of the business expenses and you don't get them incorporated in the business's finances and take the tax benefits of those expenses, et cetera. Um, but also, if you don't properly report your expenses through your business bank account and within your accounting database, you might lose track of cash burn. Um, you might not, you know, fully understand how much you're spending on a month-to-month -month basis and how that impacts your runway. Um, and the biggest killer of startups ends up being running out of cash. Um, so, you know, a quick and easy solution when you Start that business, open that business-specific banking account, and be really, really diligent about running all of your business-related expenses and income through that business banking account and keep them separate from your personal funds so that you don't lose track of those transactions and that spending. 
and that's kind of that piggybacks on separating personal and business expenses, right? I kind of just commented on that, but that's really a big one. You want to keep those separate. You want to make sure that you don't end up personally funding the business and not getting any equity or any kind of credit for it. Um, and also you want to make sure that your business uh, financials are accurate and that you've got good eyes on cash burn. Keeping records of receipts and invoices is, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, obviously, you want to have those that, the, that kind of backup for IRS requirements. Um, and it's also just good internally from an operational standpoint to do uh, and be diligent about document management. Um, it can really come back to bite you if you are missing invoices and some documentation um, that supports you know, things like your balance sheet um, or the contracts with customers, even more important. Um, you really just want to be careful and diligent about document management and keeping track of your receipts and invoices on an ongoing basis. Um, the beautiful thing is with technology nowadays, we can digitize just about everything. So the days of the shoe boxes and the big filing cabinets are gone. Um, get yourself a great scanner and uh, just be diligent about running those receipts and invoices and things like that through them and get them digitized. And um, there's a number of online data management or document management services out there uh, that really do a great job and can make your life easier. Uh, another big one, it's, uh, in a, it's one that I always like to touch on, and it, content, it tends to be one of the scarier parts of uh, the accounting and finance operations of a business, um, but it's tax compliance. And in the early stages when you're pre-funding, you really just want to be, you want to be mindful of your tax obligations. You just want to make sure that you're on top of your filings um, and you get your payments into the appropriate kind of state and municipal agencies. Uh, so, you know, there's a, number of, there's a number of items that you need to be worried about, but the big ones are, you know, making sure that your income tax returns get filed and they get filed on time. Um, if you can't file on time that you're, you know, that you're submitting an extension, um, and if you're in California, you're prepaying that California franchise tax minimum $800 on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, making sure that you're getting out of, ahead of things like business registrations and sales tax if they apply to your business. Um, you know, really just doing your best to get out ahead of your tax obligations initially. Um, there's a lot going on when you start a business on the accounting and finance side of things. Um, and tax is one that you just don't want to forego. You don't want to lose track of because it will come back to bite you. Uh, so just do your best to be proactive um, about addressing your tax obligations. Collecting payments is obviously a big one. I mentioned earlier in this slide while talking that, uh, you know, Cash burn and lack of runway is the biggest killer of startups. And obviously, um, you know, ensuring that your collection cycle is, is frictionless and that you have good relationships with your customers so that they're paying in accordance with your terms um, is incredibly important to your cash flow. Uh, so again, another big piece is making sure that the, uh, the wheels keep spinning and the cash keeps coming in when you're in the early stages and you don't have a large um, funded bank account. You don't, maybe you don't have VC backing or significant investments at that point. So cash is, cash is king. You also want to select a payroll provider. Um, oftentimes businesses are forming initially with just co-founders who may or may not be taking a salary, um, maybe some contractors. Uh, but you really want to, especially in states like California and most other states now are really kind of cracking down on this classification of 1099 contractors versus actual W-2 employees. Uh, my kind of rule of thumb is that if, if they look and smell like an employee, then they are an employee and you should treat them as such. And what I mean by treating them as such is setting up a formal payroll uh, relationship with a third party payroll provider. Um, you know, like the, the paychecks and the Zen payroll, Zen payrolls of the world, um, people who will, you know, help kind of administer the process, but make sure that you don't need to be the ones who are actually filing the payroll forms and remitting the payments. Um, it can be a complex process. There's a lot of calculation involved. Um, and these third party payroll providers are relatively inexpensive. So you can, you can get in, uh, we, 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 early growth has a lot of relationships with some payroll providers, so we can always make a recommendation if you're interested in going that route. Um, but again, if you, if they look and smell like an employee, then you want to get set up with payroll and you want to actually bring in your, uh, founders or your contractors that were initially set up as full-time W2 employees. Um, because places like the state of California are really cracking down. Um, they want their employer level taxes to be paid. Um, so they'll, they will crack down and I have, uh, participated in audits with uh, the California EDD in regards to classifying employees as contractors. And um, in the end, they end up getting their tax anyways. So something to be careful of. Uh, I would highly suggest erring on the side of caution, setting up payroll, and paying your employees as W-2 employees. Similar to my comments earlier about keeping records of receipts and invoices, you really want to stay on top of your company formation um, and your stock records, things like stock purchase agreements, 
articles of incorporation, um, all that good stuff, all of those critical kind of formation documents and what makes up the equity section of your balance sheet. It's really important to keep those contracts on hand and in order to have visibility into um, your capitalization table, for example. Um, so again, something that's quick and easy to do, but that is very important and you want to be diligent about keeping track of those stock records and really all of the contracts and the formation documents that you go through with your legal team uh, initially. Something that you definitely want to make sure that you've got a good kind of data storage solution um, or document room where all that gets saved and shared with the appropriate stakeholders in your business. Right. And just to um, follow up on, on what you were saying about, you know, if they look and feel like employees or not feel, I guess, smell, you said, <laughs> if they look and smell like employees, then they are. We've uh, we've done a webinar in the past, like I think a couple actually on this topic, because it's pretty problematic and confusing. So we've had some lawyers speak to this. So if you're interested in more clarification around that, you guys can go check out our website and just click on our YouTube channel and, and browse through some of our videos. But we definitely have stuff on that. And um, before we move on, um, Ryan, we have a couple of questions from the audience. So so um, first, Jill wants to know, um, in terms of uh, keeping records of your receipts and invoices, are there any tools that you particularly recommend for this that you like? Sure, sure. Uh, there, there are quite a few. I mean, there's expense reporting solutions out there like Expensify, um, where you can actually create expense reports, and that's especially useful if you're actually using a personal credit card or some other kind of funding source to, uh, to make business-related transactions. Um, we at, at Early Growth, we use a solution called Bill.com that is actually an accounts payable and accounts receivable module, but it has built in um, document storage. So it basically allows you to um, fax or scan or manually upload uh, kind of via your desktop documents that you can process and you can actually execute payments through the system. Um, but you can also use it simply to save documents under vendor names or customer names and things like that. So the solution that we standardize around at, at Early Growth is, is Bill.com, and it's one that I really like. But there are a number of other solutions out there. Um, there are ones that, are, that don't have an AP module included, and it's really just for document storage, um, and they can be really inexpensive. So, uh, you know, a quick Google search, and you can typically find um, quite a few options out there. Uh, like I said, Early Growth, we standardize around Bill.com. Great, thanks. And then um, you, you talked quite a bit about um, sort of, you know, the, the, the biggest um, danger facing startups is, is running out of cash. And so Natasha just wanted to know, um, in terms of best practice, how many months of runway should you kind of figure on? That's a good question. Um, there's not really a technically a rule of thumb. Uh, really, you need to think about your business roadmap and what your funding sources look like in the near term. So if you have, if for example, if you are going out and you're going to raise around and you anticipate your cash can last for another four months, well, you know you need to raise money in, sh in a shorter time frame than four months. That's mm -hmm. kind of the reality of the scenario. So it's going to depend on your business life cycle um, and your fundraising objectives and, and kind of what that roadmap looks like. And the reality is you just need to make sure, I mean, most, most startups, most founders that I'm working with and talking to, they're almost constantly in fundraising mode and in, kind of initially. Um, so the, the big and the most important consideration here is you just need to make sure that you're not in a position to run out of cash. And if you're trending towards, you know, that low bank balance, you need to be very, very active on the fundraising side of the house to ensure that you are um, in a position to take term sheets and eventually get funding prior to uh, kind of the lights going off. Right. Okay. Well, that kind of is a nice transition to, to our next stage here then. So, you know, w once you have been actively fundraising and, and you've uh, got some investment capital, how do things shift? What, what do you need to be thinking about now in terms of your accounting structure? Yes. So I really like this slide a lot. Um, and there's kind of, there's quite a bit to think about uh, when it comes to post-funding, right? Pre-funding, you want to make sure that you're kind of dotting your I's and crossing your T's, taking care of things like tax and documentation and all that good stuff. Um, once you've taken on investor capital, right, once you're in this kind of post-funding mode, um, you've got a number of other considerations to think of. And one of the biggest and most important is how you're going to leverage that capital that you just took on to increase value in your organization. So, you know, really, you're taking on this money with a goal, an objective, and typically during your fundraising process, you're outlining these goals or these, these kind of funding milestones um, in, in, in kind of what you're going to accomplish with that money. Are you going to create a prototype? Are you going to create a beta version of your software? Um, you know, depending on your product, how are you going to take this investor capital and add value to your company? 
And that's really what you need to be thinking about on a post funding, uh, from a post funding perspective, or one of the biggest considerations, right? Because eventually, and in most cases, you're not just raising one, two, um, or even three rounds, you're raising multiple rounds as your business grows over time. And so you wanna make sure that you're showing a track record of success as you raise funds, and you go out there and you, sh and you kind of shop the equity of your business to investors, you, you're going to commit to doing things like I had mentioned earlier, you know, creating a beta version of your software, you know, rolling out an app, um, um, for example, if you're, in, in, if you're in an app development company. Any number of things depending on your industry um, and just making sure that you have leveraged that capital to increase value because when you, when you go um, onto your next fundraising round and you're looking to raise additional capital, your investors are going to want to see this track record of success, see how you've taken their money um, and increased value in the equity that they have in your business. Um, so it's really an opportunity to take on this cash and um, be really strategic about how you're going to leverage it to add value. This is also an opportunity to build financial infrastructure once you've got the capital. So it's going to be thinking about things like, you know, maybe initially and up until you received funding, um, you as the business owner were doing the accounting yourself. Um, or perhaps there wasn't really the accounting getting done and you were able to raise money based, you know, more on, more on your kind of idea and your market share and things like that rather than your actual financial performance. Well, now that you've raised some money, you've got some beans to count. So you need to think about what your accounting solution like is going to look like going forward. Um, so that's not only thinking about things like what accounting database are you going to use? Does it make sense to start with QuickBooks Online or a desktop version of software? Um, maybe you've got a lot of SKUs, you're in a manufacturing company, and you need to look at a more robust accounting software like QuickBooks Enterprise or like a solution like NetSuite that's web-based. Um, also thinking about things like who you're going to partner with for, uh, for your legal team. Um, business insurance, um, as well as actually, you know, potentially outsourced accounting or internally hiring some resources. Um, so thinking about how you're going to build your financial infrastructure, you know, oftentimes uh, as you raise money and go through rounds, there are going to be significantly um, more reporting requirements and financial statement deadlines and things like that. So you want to make sure that behind the scenes you have the financial infrastructure um, to meet those types of needs, whether it's, you know, board or investor reporting, uh, maybe you've got loan covenants that you need to meet and, re and reporting requirements there on the lender side. Um, you just want to make sure that you have that infrastructure behind the scenes to kind of satisfy those requirements on an ongoing basis. Talked a little bit about clarifying funding objectives. I, here at Early Growth and kind of across the startup community, um, you'll hear this concept of milestone funding touched on a lot. We are huge, huge believers in milestone funding. Um, and what that means is, again, piggybacking on my comments earlier in this slide is, just you know, taking the money that you're receiving from your investors and parlaying that into additional value, accomplishing, uh, accomplishing what you've set out to accomplish during the fundraising process, and actually executing upon that with with that with those funds that you've received. That's what we mean by funding objectives. Kind of how you're going to take that capital, how you're going to leverage it to increase value. A track record for success in that regard will allow uh, you to raise more money in the future and really take a lot of friction out of that process. Managing cash flow is pretty straightforward. Whether you're pre-funding or post-funding, cash is king. You want to stay on top of cash flow. Make sure you have insight into your, um, your cash burn and the, your runway in months and make sure that you are um, you know, leveraging the capital that you've received to meet those funding objectives between now and the next round, but also thinking about the next round to ensure that you're not running out of cash um, prior to receiving additional funding. Investor reportings, again, that, that oftentimes kicks in, almost always kicks in after you receive funding. Um, you'll have some, you know, whether it's a monthly or quarterly requirement to report to your board and to your investors. Again, that's a big reason why uh, creating a sound financial infrastructure once you've got the cash to do so is incredibly important. Um, you know, your time as a, as a, as a business founder is, is very, very expensive, I would say, right? Your opportunity cost is extremely high. Um, so eventually you need to make the decision about whether or not it makes sense to continue to be very involved and kind of in the weeds from a financial perspective and an accounting perspective um, versus bringing in someone to help, bringing in a professional service like early growth to help uh, ensure that you have clean financials for your investors on an ongoing basis so that you as the co-founder um, can, can stay focused on what we talked about earlier, your funding objectives and adding value to the business and not necessarily worrying about data entry and accounting. I talked about this as well, you know, hire professionals to help the company become GAAP compliant. What we mean by GAAP compliant, GAAP stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Um, it's essentially, you know, the way that 
financial the way that investors want to see financial statements reported and it's consistent from company to company so that we can compare apples to apples from a value perspective or investors can compare apples to apples from a value perspective um, if you're if you're a corporation if you're a c corp you're actually required to produce gap compliant financial statements so again it's one of those situations where now that you've received funding um, and you've got a lot on your plate from a operations perspective and from a creating value perspective, um, you want to make sure that you're building out the infrastructure behind the scenes to ensure that you've got sound financial statements, you know, you've got strong legal support, uh, you've got appropriate business insurance coverage, all those types of things um, that really come into play once you've, uh, you've raised funds. And you're also doing a lot of you're kind of spread thin, doing a lot of things operationally and growing the company and, and, and kind of building the business. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I guess that kind of leads to this, you know, you're talking a little bit about the opportunity cost of, of entrepreneurs, you know, founders, at what point does it not make sense for them to go with a loan, you know, to sit there and do their own spreadsheet? So when, what are really the, the triggers? What's the inflection points where it makes sense to pay out to have a professional financial services firm support you? Sure. I mean, in, in, in our experience with early growth, it typically makes sense or we see our clients engaging once they've raised a round of over $500,000 or half a million. Um, other considerations are around revenue. Um, so once, once our clients have kind of gone live with revenue, we do have a lot of pre-revenue companies that are just kind of venture-backed companies and they've raised funds and they're out there building their products, but they are pre-revenue. Um, but we all, we've also have clients who actually go live with revenue um, and it also at that point makes sense for them to kind of in, they, to kind of bring in a solution on the accounting and finance side of things whether it's hiring somebody internally or bringing in a service like early growth where you not only get a, kind of a bookkeeper accounting resource but also some strategic financial guidance in the form of a CFO um, so so typically we see our clients engaging and it makes sense to engage once you've raised the money or once you've gone live with revenue and you've got some cash flow that needs to be tracked and properly accounted for um, or you have professional or institutional investors, which I mentioned earlier, that require you um, to produce some sort of financial reporting or have these kind of financial reporting requirements um, that as a business owner, you know, you either aren't familiar with the accounting side of the house in order to create gap compliant financial statements or your opportunity cost is too high and it just makes sense to bring in a professional who can do it efficiently um, and for a reasonable amount of money. Okay, great. So, I mean, as long as, you know, if, if uh, you know, people listening in, if they haven't hit any of these points yet, as long as they're sort of laying the foundation, as you outlined in the first two slides, they can go with a loan, right? It's it's fine for them to do that. Exactly. Yeah. It, it really is. It becomes a decision. Again, I, I always come back to kind of the opportunity cost of you as founders um, and the reality that you need to be kind of have eyes on the prize when it comes to funding objectives. And so you need to make sure that the operational needs of your business, things like accounting and finance support, aren't getting in the way of your funding objectives. Right, makes sense. Um, okay, so digging in a little bit um, to more of the, the details here, can you talk a little bit more about how, you know, to create a sound system for accounts payable? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I'll run through this, uh, this slide pretty quick. The reality is, and I guess the primary message here, and I've already said this a couple of times, so I appreciate you bearing with me, cash is king, right? We really want to be uh, and are concerned with cash flow initially and want to make sure that we're kind of constantly on top of our cash flow. And there are kind of small adjustments and things that we can do to, to help that, to increase cash flow. Um, and, and on the AP side of things, um, they're kind of quick and easy. So you can set up a system early to help maximize cash flow um, and create your essential financial reports. It's kind of the first bullet point. I mentioned bill.com earlier in this, uh, earlier in the slide deck here. And that's one of the systems that we use to really help the AP systems, uh, not only for early growth, we actually use it internally, but also we leverage it for a lot of our clients. Um, it's kind of a quick and easy way to get the bills paid, to kind of maintain visibility into your actual invoices and your, your kind of customer relationships. Um, and maintain all of the kind of document and data management. So it's really a good way to stay on top of your bills and not lose track of them and make sure that your system's reconciled and that when you're closing the books each month, you've got all of your AP items entered. You've got all of your bills up to date and your balance sheet is essentially accurate. Um, but when you start to kind of pay more and more attention to, to accounts payable as your bill volume and payment volume increases over time, you really want to identify some of your larger vendors um, and try to work out terms with them. 
you know, see, see how long you can extend your payment terms. Again, your concern is, is kind of increasing or maintaining cash flow on your side. Um, the better terms you can get, kind of the longer you can delay making payments to the vendors, the more it helps out your personal cash flow. Um, so if you have good relationships with your vendors, um, you can oftentimes negotiate or put contracts into place that allow you for um, terms of, you know, net 30, even net 45, net 60, um, you know, depending on your relationship with that vendor and what you're buying from them and kind of what volume. Um, that often determines what type of leverage that you have. You want, but you want to really want to make sure that you're tracking every expense, every receipt, that anything that is related to your business gets run through um, accounts payable, or at least you know if you're if you're running it through your bank account, like a debit card or a credit card, that you're that you're entering and reconciling all of those expenses on a month-to-month -month basis, so that you have transparency into your spending and into your um, your kind of cash outlays. And of course, if we're talking about accounts payable, we have to address the flip side of that. So how about, you know, how can you improve your cash collections? What should you do to set up your accounts receivable function? Sure. So, you know, the big and easy item here is to make kind of clean and easy to read intuitive invoices and financial statements. So you want as little kind of noise as possible on your invoices and financial statements. You want to, you want to kind of uh, eliminate as much friction as possible from your client actually paying those invoices. So to the extent that you can get out of the business or your employees can get out of the business of, you know, constantly having to account manage and discuss with clients to make sure that they understand their balance due and, you know, kind of prompt them to make payments, um, the better. Right. You want this this process to kind of be as automated as you possibly can. Um, so intuitive kind of friendly invoices, you know, making sure that you're sending statements so that um, historical unpaid invoices don't get lost track of. You know, those are all kind of sound processes and, and easy processes to put into place to help make sure that the cash continues to come in the door. Um, we talked about terms on the last slide with vendors, right, extending terms as long as you can. Um, with vendors to kind of keep the cash in your bank as long as you can. Well, we're on we're talking about AR now, so it's kind of the flip side of things. We want to shorten terms with our customers as, as kind of much as reasonably possible. Um, so you want to try to avoid kind of extending those those lengthy terms to your customers as much as possible and ensure that, you know, as soon after you've kind of satisfied your requirement, you've you've sold them that software license or you've provided that service or product. Um, that you're getting is paid as soon after that as possible to make sure that the cash is coming in the door um, faster than it's going out the door. So that's what we mean by establishing kind of uh, a collection timeline and a credit guideline. Great. And now I'm um, moving on to everyone's favorite topic <laughs> of taxes, or if, if we were in person right now, I'd pass out donuts to everyone to make sure everyone's staying awake. But, you know, I, you, people don't like thinking about taxes until it becomes a problem. But, you know, what, what are the sort of minimum obligations that you, you need to be aware of so that you keep yourself out of trouble and it doesn't become a too exciting topic in the world of your business? Sure. Sure, that's a, this is a great slide as well. Um, so one of, the, one of the best things that you can do in the early stages or when you're forming your company is to partner with a good legal team. Um, and again, that's something that early growth, we can provide referrals if you're interested in kind of going this route or you need some, some advice in regards to selecting a legal team. Um, we've got some great kind of preferred vendors that we, we and our clients often work with um, that have had a great experience. Um, but that's kind of the, one of the biggest <clears throat> and most important first steps is to select the correct legal entity for your company. Um, and that's something that you can discuss with your legal team at length. Um, but if you're interested in pursuing um, venture funding, um, you know, and, and taking on institu institutional investors as well, you're most likely want to you're most likely going to want to set up your company as a C corp, um, potentially a Delaware C corp. It's what most of our companies who are venture backed or in in fundraising process are set up as. Um, it, again, it just reduces the friction um, with investors. They're, the the kind of case law in Delaware um, is some of the kind of oldest and most comprehensive in the in the history of the United States. Um, so it tends to be an area where investors are most comfortable and are most willing to um, put their money. Uh, oftentimes, I see client businesses or companies that come on board and they are set up as an LLC, for example and are interested in raising a Series A round, but before they can do so, um, they actually end up having to spend tens of thousands of dollars converting to a C-Corp after the fact. Um, so it's something that I typically will recommend you get out of the way initially. Uh, just form a C-Corp right off the bat if you're planning on raising investor funding. Then from a tax compliance perspective, right, I mentioned this earlier, um, but again, you, you want to make sure that you're staying on top of your taxes, that you're getting the appropriate filings done, and that you're getting them done on time, and you're getting your payments out on time. 
Um, so, you know, things like federal and state income taxes is pretty straightforward. We all deal with that on the personal side, you know, making sure that your corporate taxes are done or extended prior to March 15th. If you're an LLC um, or a partnership, that's April 15th on an ongoing basis. Um, so you want to make sure that it gets done and you get those payments made. Um, if, you're, if you're a California uh, registered company, even if you're pre-revenue, there is an $800 per year um, franchise tax that they call it that needs to be paid. Um, so you want to stay on top of that. Cal state of California will not lose track of it, even if you do. Um, I can guarantee it. You know, and there's also city tax obligations. If you're operating in the city of San Francisco um, or another jurisdiction in California or any state for that matter, you're going to need to have a business license where you're physically located. Um, the, the, your local municipality will almost always have a website or a helpline that you can call and get some more information about what the filing looks like. Um, but that's something kind of quick and easy that you're required to do and kind of need to do, get that business license done. Um, a lot of states also have kind of secondary reporting requirements, or I'm, I'm sorry, a lot of cities also have kind of secondary reporting requirements. Uh, the state of San Francisco, for example, not only has kind of this business registration requirement, um, but they also have uh, a payroll tax that's now actually being phased out and replaced by a gross receipts tax. Um, so it's kind of, a, it's, it's a percentage or a basis point that's applied to your overall revenue um, that you actually owe to the city on an ongoing and annual basis, and there's a filing required as well. Uh, long story short, depending on where you're physically located and where your business is, uh, where your business operates out of, if it's a multi-state type of situation, um, there are going to be tax obligations on the kind of city, federal, and state level um, that you need to be concerned with and make sure that you're, you're addressing. So some initial research um, goes a long way and or bringing in a firm like Early Growth um, who's really kind of uh, tried and true when it comes to tax compliance on an ongoing basis. Uh, just to keep that off your plate and keep the kind of scary notices out of the mailbox. We talked about separating business and personal finances, um, so I won't touch on that too much again. The main point here is that you want to make sure that you're running all of your business expenses through the business. You know, in the early stages, you want to make sure that you have the tax benefit of that spending um, on an ongoing basis. That's what's going to allow you to deduct, deduct the business expenses. Um, if you are at actually uh, making money if you if you have income you want to make sure that you're paying quarterly taxes in advance um, and then staying on top of payroll taxes again I highly recommend that you work with a third-party payroll provider do not try to file and pay taxes on yourself and do things like the quarterly 941 filings for your employees um, it's complex these businesses do it it's their bread and butter um, it's it's much more cost-effective to pay a third party to help administer the, uh, the payroll and tax filings um, and then finally, at year end, uh, make sure that you're on top of your 1099s. Um, that's, the, that's an IRS reporting requirement. Um, any vendor who you pay for services, you know, things like legal, rent, um, et cetera, just basically not physical goods or tangible property. Um, anyone you pay for services in excess of $600 on an annual basis needs to be submitted to a 1099 form on or before January 31st each, each new year. You know, it's it's kind of interesting to me. I mean, I guess it's it's not surprising, but how, you know, all the sort of points on this slide really echo things that we've heard earlier, right? You know, about separating business and personal finances and about keeping track of your expenses so you can deduct them. It's kind of, they all tie into each other, right? If you're laying the right foundation, then it's going to help you through with your tax obligations as well. Exactly. It's all interrelated. So the, the, the more you can do in, in kind of these items, Stated earlier, the better it's going to pay dividends in the long run. It really will. Right. Um, okay. So um, moving on to something a, a little bit more scintillating than taxes, perhaps <laughs> um, financial projections. So I know that people have a lot of questions about you know the differences between top-down projections and bottom-up, and sort of how how you do them and and when you would need to use these different kinds of projections. So can you talk a little bit between the two of them and and how they work? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the way that I kind of like to talk about or compare the top down versus the bottom up projection and when to use um, which specific approach, for me, it typically tends to relate to what type of data you have and how confident you are with that data. Um, so for example, you might take the top down approach if you aren't, if you don't necessarily have traction in your market at this point, you don't really have any financial data that's driving your projections um, or the assumptions that your projections are based on, you know, it might make more sense to start with a top-down projection. Look with your overall market size. And then within the overall market, you start to kind of funnel downwards and identify your, your particular segment of the market and how you're going to capture that market. And in order to capture that market, what, what type of expenses and what 
type of spending that you're going to need to outlay in order to support that kind of, you know, gaining that traction or securing those customers, for example. Um, so, in, so in that type of situation, you know, maybe you're not live with revenue, maybe you don't have a product, maybe you don't have, you know, a beta product out there where you've got some kind of track record of success or some data to support what your revenue growth is going to look like over time. You might start with this more kind of macro approach or perspective, so starting with your market size and kind of carving out your portion of the market from there and then substantiating that, you know, your assumption as to what kind of market share that you can take on you know, actually then moving on to the expenses or the cash outlays that you're going to need to substantiate and support your um, kind of ownership of that segment or your revenue in, in relation to that segment. As opposed to the bottom-up projection, you know, where maybe you have some more sound financial data, maybe you actually have a product out in the market with customers, whether it's a beta or a live version, um, and you have some actual data points that you can bake into um, or use to support your assumptions and your projections. And that's typically where I would recommend, you know, moving towards a bottom-up projection approach. Um, so you, maybe you have some near-term revenue um, data and growth that you can extrapolate over the next one to three years, and you can kind of defend based on your historical performance. And once you do that, you also will have some data as, you know, what kind of spending and what kind of uh, infrastructure was required to support that revenue near-term and start to identify, you know, what what costs are fixed and what costs are variable, you know, what costs will scare, scale as your revenue scales in order to really paint the whole comprehensive picture as to what your business performance will look like based on, you know, your market size or based on your assumed revenue growth over the next one to three years um, and then kind of run with it from there. Uh, we have a question here from Steve. He wants to know um, if you're fundraising, which of these or both would you want to include in your pitch deck? So my advice would be to, the more detail you have, um, the more detail you want to get into your projection. So if you're able to create a bottom-up projection, if you have some sound insight into your revenue and your potential growth um, on, a, you know, on an ongoing basis, that's the route that I would go. The reality is that when you get in front of investors and you're in the fundraising process and you're presenting projections to um, your potential investors while you're out looking for term sheets and things like that, you know, your investors are going to ask you every single question that you've thought of personally um, and ones you probably haven't thought of. You know, their, re their goal really is to poke holes in your projections um, and ask the hard and tough questions and make sure that you've got the answers for them. So the more detail, right, the more data-driven that these projections can be, um, the easier it's going to be for you to do a good job when they're trying to poke holes through your projections because you have something behind the scenes that you're actually using to substantiate that assumption that makes sense, you know, that's quantifiable potentially. That's the route that you want to go. The more detailed, the better. The more comprehensive, the more you've worked through the questions and the considerations that you think investors might have, the better shape that you're going to be in. You want those answers to be kind of self-evident in your projections. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that a lot of times people uh, think that the investors just want to see those pie in the sky, top down projections, right? So, you know, the numbers are, are more big, <laughs> are bigger and more impressive. Um, but like you said, they're also unsubstantiated, you know, so while it m might be nice to see that investors are savvy, right? They're not going to believe these huge numbers if there's no um, evidence to back them up, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. So um, that takes us to financial reporting. And, you know, you talked a little bit about gap financial statements, um, but can you talk a little bit more about different kinds of financial reporting and, and what they reveal? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so projections are really important as you're kind of strategizing what your business is going to look like going forward and um, as you seek new rounds of fundraising. Um, but there are other reporting, there's other, you know, kind of financial reporting that can be used internally um, in order to help kind of support your operational decision making. Um, to the extent that you can drive your business decision making by, you know, quantifiable financial data, the better shape that you're going to be, right? It's that kind of old idiom that the numbers don't lie. Um, you know, we all have a gut when it comes to being an entrepreneur or a business um, or running a business, but to the extent that we can have or, or base our business decisions on kind of sound financial data, um, the more likely we are to succeed. Um, and so we can do that by creating, you know, things like a budget on an ongoing basis or on, a, on an annual basis. And on an ongoing basis, actually reporting your actuals or comparing your actuals versus the budget to make sure that you're not um, overspending. 
or you're not missing revenue targets and things like that. Basically keeping track of your financial performance on an ongoing basis and comparing it to a budget that you would have prepared in advance to make sure that you're on track, um, to make sure that you're not overspending and to, or, to, or even underspending. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great, great tool to use initially. Um, as your business grows, you know, that, that might be something that you need to revisit and modify because, you know, a lot, a lot can happen in the early stages of business, but having a budget is really important um, because we can piggyback or go up a, a dot here to the, to the cash burn reporting, which I've, you know, mentioned multiple times and I'll probably continue saying it until I turn blue. It's just, it's critically important that you have cash to keep the lights on and keep your business performing um, as an ongoing concern. So, you know, things like maintaining a budget and keeping track of that budget, you know, things like having cash, sound cash burn reporting and insight into um, your spend on a month-to-month -month basis and your bank balance and kind of what your fundraising roadmap looks like on an ongoing basis are critically important. Um, but then at a basic level, right, you've got your, your typical financial statements, um, your profit and loss report or your income statement, um, your cash flow statements and your balance sheet. You know, these are all important items to, um, you know, you, you, that you want to have uh, on an ongoing basis. You, I really support having a clean monthly close on a month-to-month -month basis and having a, you know, a new P&L for each month and really understanding what your business performance looks like, what your revenue growth looks like, you know, making sure that your spending is in line with expectations on an ongoing basis. Um, this financial reporting is not only useful and probably going to be required by your investors down the road, but it's incredibly useful and important for you, potentially more so, to use internally. Um, and to really, you know, be close to the numbers and understand your business's financial performance and really what that means to you. And, and what does it mean to you? I mean, what, what sort of things would you learn from your financial statements that could help guide your future development? Sure. I mean, you can kind of, you can kind of walk down either one of the financial statements, like the balance sheet or the P&L. Um, I mean, P&L is relatively straightforward, right? You can keep I'm a big I'm a big believer, and all of our clients get what we call 12-month trend reports. So actually looking at the balance sheet and the P&L over 12 months and understanding, you know, how revenue is growing or declining over time, um, if, especially if you have different segments of revenue, really being able to isolate them and track them individually and understand, you know, what what products are, that you're selling are making the most money and have the best margin. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that's that's another you know great point. It's so sorry, and and this is gonna this is gonna um, change from industry to industry, from business to business, but each one of your businesses likely has, um, and you can do some research online, do a little bit of your own due diligence, but these KPIs, these key performance indicators, um, you know, on a, on a SaaS-based business, looking at things like, you know, how many clients are you churning or losing on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, look, if you're in a manufacturing business, you know, really looking at your, your cost of goods sold, your build of materials, and understanding, you know, what your margin is on each widget that you sell. Um, and ensure that that margin is, is, is capable of um, or trending towards, you know, covering the overhead um, that's required to, you know, paying your employees and paying your rent and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a number of, of real valuable insights that you can pull out of your financial statements, and it's going to depend on um, oftentimes what industry you're in. Um, but then kind of at a more macro level, you know, I talk about gross margin. You know, you talk about your G&A spending or your overhead spending, um, keeping track of your cost of sales or the actual, you know, the actual inputs required for you to create that product or that revenue. Um, and then, you know, moving on to the balance sheet and looking at things like what your cash balance looks like on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, what your, you know, kind of what your AR collection patterns look like and the timing around AR and collections. Um, you know, what the debt section of your balance sheet looks like, what you're taking on for uh, vendor loans, you know, what you're accruing for interest over time, when does those interest payments become due if you, uh, you know, if you take on convertible debt and things like that. Um, what does your capitalization table look like? What, right, what does the equity section of your balance sheet look like? What does that mean to potential investors in future rounds? Um, will it make it easier for you to raise additional money? Will it make, you know, make it more difficult? Will it create friction? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of insight that you can get out of your financial statements, and it's going to depend on, you know, your business, your industry, and uh, kind of your business life cycle. Right, right. No, I think that's really helpful. That's great. Um, okay, and then you want to just say a, a little bit about valuation, and, and this is about, you know, more of the, the 409A valuation as opposed to your business valuation. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll touch on this really briefly. We partner um, with some other valuation firms, and this is, this is a, a sound consideration um, for any new business, especially if you're issuing employees, 
uh, stock options, you know, incentive stock options to employees, um, you're really required to have a 409A valuation on an annual basis. Um, this is something that we could probably have an entire presentation on. Um, but it's really important that you have uh, an annual valuation, especially if you're issuing employee stock options, um, and also prior to fundraising rounds, um, to, to really benchmark the valuation of your company and your stock to make sure that you know when you're out fundraising and you're structuring these deals with investors, um, that you are actually allocating the right amount of equity for the cash that you're receiving. Um, and so the process of getting a valuation is it's pretty comprehensive and pretty detailed, but part of it is kind of benchmarking your performance in your industry um, against your competitors um, in order to kind of create this intrinsic value, um, which you'll assign to your equity, your common stock, and your preferred shares. Um, and it'll help kind of indicate how much of your company that you actually need to give up <coughs> as you pursue additional funding rounds. Um, so it's, it's something that is, that's important. It's an important piece of the business, and you can create relationships with valuation partners. You, you do have some, you know, some flexibility in working with your partners to get to a valuation that you think is fair and makes sense for your business. Um, and that's an important piece of the consideration. It's, it's having a valuation partner that really knows and understands you and your business and where you're taking it and can build that into the kind of valuation process. Great. And, you know, I, I should know if we have a presentation on this, <laughs> but I can't actually remember. I, I think that we do, but I do know that we have a lot of articles around this. So, um, again, if this is a topic that anyone listening in is uh, interested in exploring further, just you can go to our blog and, and search for valuation and you'll see a lot of, uh, you know, articles about this topic from different angles. Um, and we have a question, another question here from Jacob. He's saying, is FMV required for both qualified and non-qualified options? Is, is FMV? Sorry, FMV, fair market value. Is the fair market value required for both qualified and non-qualified options? I know that it's, that it's uh, required for qualified. I'm not sure about non-qualified off the top of my head. Um, the conservative accountant in me wants to say yes, <laughs> um, but that's something that I would have to research to give you a, a proper answer. Sure. You know what, Jacob? We will follow up with you offline. We have your email address, so we'll make sure that we research that and, and get back to you by email. Okay. Um, great. Let's see. Uh, okay, and then this is, you know, I, I think you actually kind of spoke to this already. Do you, I don't know if you want to dive in deeper, but, you know, you said that you want a valuation company that really understands your business and it's going to work with you to get your best valuation. Do you want to add anything to that? You know, I think these, this slide really speaks for itself. You know, the big thing is is that you're creating a relationship. This, this is a business partner. Um, so you want a firm that you're comfortable working with and that you're comfortable having an ongoing relationship with, um, and that's willing, willing to work with you. Things like, you know, Things like free revisions as uh, assumptions and, and business drivers change are, are kind of important and can save your business quite a bit of money. Um, but yeah, you're, it's a biz you're, you're selecting a business partner. So you want to be comfortable working with that individual um, to the extent that you can get references and understanding from other you know, founders and entrepreneurs that have worked with that valuation company, the better. Great. And that takes us here to the end of our presentation. We um, do have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to stall for a second <laughs> and see if anyone wants to enter in any questions. Um, let's see. It looks like we have a question here. Uh, all right. And some of these, you know, might be specific. So again, if we can't, you know, if you can't answer them off the top of your head, Ryan, we can research and get back to them. Um, but Laura wants to know, what are the tax implications for early stage consultants paid in stock, not options, when the company does not yet have revenue? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, the biggest thing that I can tell you is to make sure that you fill out an 83B election form. Um, what that allows you to do is when you're paid in equity or in options initially, if you don't file an 83B form, um, I think it's within, it's either conservative accountant in me is going to say 30 days of receiving your options, but it might be more like 60, but I'm going to say 30 for the intents and purposes of this call. <laughs> um, but it, but an 83B election allows you to avoid needing to basically pay what's called phantom income. Uh, so if you don't file an 83B election and you receive stock in one of your client businesses as an, you know, an outside service provider or a contractor, um, what can happen is that that stock gets revalued to market at the end of each year. And you as a stockholder, 
um, and as a personal income tax filer, actually need to recognize, you know, initially you will have received that stock for, let's say, a dollar a share um, or, or that option with a certain, you know, associated value. And then on an ongoing basis, that will get marked to market. And even if you haven't ex exercised your options, um, even if you haven't sold your shares, let's say they increased 50% in value and you still are just own a piece of paper, um, you'll actually have to pay income tax on those quote unquote gains. Um, and so an, 83B, an 83B election allows you to avoid kind of recognizing these phantom gains. Um, basically you don't need to, you, you don't need to report a gain on uh, your options or your stock until a sale transaction actually occurs. Um, so the biggest and most important is to make sure you fill out an 83B election when you're taking on equity in lieu of compensation. And as a follow-up question, Laura wants to know, is that true for an LLC, not a C-Corp? Uh, that is absolutely true for a C-Corp. Um, you know, it's a little bit different with an LLC because LLCs have membership units. Um, although I believe you can still, I believe you still can complete an 83B for an LLC when you're taking on membership units as opposed to actual stock with a C Corp. Um, so 100% for a C Corp, and I'll, well, we should probably take the LLC one offline. I'll have to do some research. I don't want to give you bad information. I'm not exactly sure that it's possible. 100% for a C Corp, though. <laughs> okay, great. So Laura, we can follow up with, with you as well offline and, and have that conversation. Um, and for anyone else, if, if you have additional questions, oh, sorry, it's, now they're coming in. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, sorry. And some of these are really specific, so it is kind of hard to answer, you know, off the cuff, but we'll try. And if not, we can do some follow up. So um, let's see. Stan, Stan Fell wants to know, if you take income from a California LLC into your personal income, is the $800 California franchise tax deductible in any fashion? That's a specific tax. Can you, can you say that one yeah, time? yeah, it's very, it's, you know, uh, just, just for the record, Ryan's not a tax accountant, so I'm not sure that he can answer this, but let's see. Um, Stanfield wants to, wants to know, if you take income from a California LLC into your personal income, is the $800 California franchise tax deductible in any fashion? So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that works. Like, like Erica said, I'm not a, I'm not a tax accountant. Um, you actually wouldn't. So if you are a sole proprietor in California, I guess the question here is that whether the $800 that you pay for, for a California franchise tax would be taxable. That's something I don't actually know. That's, that's a tax consulting question. Um, I'd like to say that it is, but I'm not sure. So you know what, um, Sam Fell, for you, I'm going to connect you with one of our business development managers and they can have a, a conversation with you and, and get a little more information out um, and see if they can get an answer to your question based on that conversation. Okay. Um, cool. And okay, everyone's saying thanks, thanks. Sorry, I'm monitoring the questions here. <laughs> Great. And so, you know, on our site, just so you guys know, we do have a, a, a link that you can just click on and you fill out a quick contact us form and that gets you a free 30 minute financial consultation. So it's a sit down conversation with one of our business development managers about your business and they can really get at some of these questions. And, you know, if you're kind of based on this presentation, if you're kind of wondering more about what your accounting needs might be and, and want to talk about it more, that's a great opportunity for you to sit down with someone and, and just get a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one insight. So I highly recommend you filling out that form. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can also just um, email us or give us a call at the numbers here. Um, so with that said, thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope that you did find this useful. Um, and thank you, Ryan, so much. Um, I think that you but did a great job of <laughs> really giving some great insights in, in a really clear, concise way. So we appreciate that. Um, and just a quick plug, our next webinar is scheduled for Monday, um, May 18th, and it's Debt Funding Options for Going Companies with Molly Otter, who's the Chief Investment Officer for Lighter Capital, and David Ehrenberg, who's the CEO of Early Growth Financial Services. And, you know, we do a lot of talking about equity um, and not as much talking about debt funding options. So I think it's going to be um, really insightful um, and, and a good thing for people to consider of different funding options. So I hope you'll consider joining us for that. Um, um, if you want to register or see what other webinars we have coming up, you can go to our website and check out our events page. Um, so with that, thanks again, Ryan, and thanks to you all for attending. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.